Thank you, Ian. Inspiration. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Not any old inspiration, mind. Uh, a big challenge at the moment in the world is how do we inspire young people to become scientists? And I'm going to do it from an unusual angle. That's the first thing I'm going to say, because I'm going to give governments a kick in, right? And all you governments out there, listen to me now. Um, it's very strange, you know, they're not prioritizing funding for basic fundamental research, and it's a big, big mistake. All over the place you see this, and if they don't do this, if they stop funding basic research, there'll be no new blood in science, so young people will not become scientists, and there'll be no advances. The real advances come from basic fundamental research. So it's a very serious topic, and I want them all to listen to me now and tell them to cough onto themselves, if that's the best way to put it. And if you look at this everywhere, it's staggering. The Canadian government. National Research Council, a refocus on business-driven, industry-relevant research. Even the Swiss, the Swiss National Science Foundation, cutting funding for basic research. The UK is a nightmare at the moment, as most British scientists would agree. Grant amounts in decline, success rates in decline, funds becoming focused on a small number of applied topics. It's absolutely horrific out there. And look at this, even cancer research, you'd think in the name of God that the cancer research charities would fund basic research. Cancer Research UK is halting basic science grants. So it's a mega, mega mistake. What about Ireland? Well, let me talk about Ireland just for a minute. Uh, a big report came out earlier this year. It's the research prioritization exercise. And this is a quote from it. They're making our recommendations about priority areas of focus. We need a new overriding policy objective to, this is too long, isn't it? To accelerate the delivery of specific economic outcomes. He should have said we're not funding maths, right? But, uh, <laughs> but, the, this is the Irish government's response. Now, um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel with the Irish government, which I'll come back to, but I think this is a big mistake. These are the areas that the Irish government have nominated. It's a bit like James Joyce, who wrote a grant application to SFI. And SFI writes back and says, Dear Mr. Joyce, we don't like that idea of writing about that day in June, that single day, you know, in 1904. Write a guide to tourism in Kerry. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> And Mr. Joyce would be upset by this. Now, there are some countries booking the trend. We must give them some credit. To, you know, for example, Mark, Marcus Storch has highlighted this. And he, he's a very important guy, I think, in his opinion leading. And he's influenced the French government to some extent. He said this. He was the chair of the, he's the, chair of the Nobel Foundation. He was also the founder of AGA, that, that company that makes those cookers. And he reorganized the Swedish banks. So we need him here. So he must have some credibility. But he said this. He said, there are two kinds of research, basic and applied. Both are necessary. But in the Western world, we're drastically cutting back on basic research. Research, he says. 90% of Nobel laureates are basic researchers. Some work on a problem for 20 years. I think cutting back on this kind of research is the greatest threat to our survival. There's a claim, right? Now, of course, I've got a vested interest because I'm a scientist. I want governments to give me money to do my basic research. I'm an immunologist, though, and my, my re research is quite, quite applied. We work on new medicines, trying to find new treatments for disease. The reason I want basic research funded is because the best labs are the basic research labs. The best training you get in science is in a basic research lab, and I want to poach those people into my immunology lab. And of course, they go into society more generally. So it's very important, the training aspect as well. The French are booking the trend. And Sarkozy said this, even though he doesn't say, you know, he used to say stupid things from time to time. He said this, he said, without basic research, there can be no applications. After all, electricity and electric light bulb were not invented by incremental improvements in the candle. <laughs> There is a candle. Well, that was good, right? And, and amazingly, the NIH in the US, the biggest funder of research, $3 billion a year, they've been criticized heavily for not funding basic research. Their director, Francis Collins, has now reiterated the NIH will most assuredly continue to fund basic research. Today's basic research is the engine that powers therapeutic discoveries. And then he says this, they need to know that basic research is the type of science that the private sector, which requires rapid returns on investment, cannot afford to fund. The nation must support a broad portfolio of basic research. Now let's test him later. People don't believe him. But that's a, a statement that, you know, we're gonna keep funding basic, basic research. Companies won't do it, so governments have to is the bottom line. Now let me talk about this. So the two types, basic and applied, forget that. We don't like that terminology. There's only one type of research, to boldly go where no one's gone before. <laughs> That's what inspires people, not applied research. On my own little story, I mean, when I was in school in sixth year, I was inspired by a biology teacher, Mr. Mooney. A shout out for teachers. I bet there's some teachers here. And Mr. Mooney really inspired me. And at that time, a friend of mine called Gerard Donahue, I was cycling home from school with him, and I said, I might become a scientist. And he said, don't be ridiculous. He said, that's boring. I said, what do you mean? He said, scientists measure like toxins and shellfish and stuff. You know, it's terrible. And I said, no, no, I want to be a scientist. I want to discover things. And that was my real passion early on. The second thing that got me was we were doing English literature. 
and we did Keats. Remember that poem, right? This wonderful poem. And the teacher said, Luke, write an essay on this poem. And it's thou still unravaged bride of quietness, thou foster child of science, or, or, sorry, <laughs> of silence and slow time. That's a good Freudian slip. He ends with what mad pursuit, what struggle to escape. This is about a piece of crockery, right? And I said, I can't write about this. I read a second poem that year, and that poem was called DNA. And that got me. I said, DNA is interesting, and thanks to Mr. Mini. Of course, what really upset me was that term, what mad pursuit, Francis Crick uses that as the name of his autobiography. So that was a bit of a shame but, and a strange irony. But DNA got me, and it was the inspiration of that. Another hero, of course, Charles Darwin. What song was that, Mr. Charles Darwin, of the goal to ask? That's, of course, R.E.M. famously. Great line, isn't it? He had the gall to ask where do species come from. Fundamental research, and he was able to find that out. And about a year ago, I was in Christ College in Cambridge where Darwin went. And my mate there, Nick Gay, said, do you want to see Darwin's signature on the degree register? I said, oh, yeah. And he showed me. And there's Charles Darwin. And amazingly, guess whose name is beneath him? <laughs> Richard Dawkins. And people say there's no God, you see. <laughs> with, that, with that kind of thing happening, you know. <laughs> that was amazing. And then another great hero, Neil Armstrong, died, of course, sadly. And this is a bit weird one. The last talk he gave in his life was back in May to the certified practicing accountants of Australia. What a strange thing. And the reason for that was his father was an accountant. And in that talk, he says something very good. He says this. He says, NASA has been one of the most successful public investments in motivating students to do well and achieve all they can achieve. It's sad we are turning the program in a direction where it will reduce the amount of motivation and stimulation to provide young people. And he was kicking NASA, because they are moving away now from the more adventurous type exploration. And Armstrong was a huge inspiration for me and my generation, obviously. And then, of course, I'd also name another famous hero, Carl Sagan, remember him? What's strange about him is he was a big advocate of this. He said, smoke weed every day. <laughs> Made him even more popular, I think. But again, a big hero. And then, of course, we had David Attenborough, the great David Attenborough, inspired us. Now, these are fantastic people. We're just interested in knowledge for its own sake, and we need these people to inspire the next generation. Let me give you one more example in my own field. I eventually became an immunologist, and this man inspired me hugely, Jules Hoffman. He won the Nobel Prize last October for the immune system, and he only ever worked in fruit flies, right? He won the Nobel Prize for medicine. His interest, he told me, was as a child, he got fascinated by grasshoppers. And his father, would, he was an entomologist, talked about grasshoppers. And he, he re they realized, entomologists, grasshoppers never get infected. And that got Hoffman's imagination. Why are grasshoppers so resistant to infection? He began working on grasshoppers' immune system, a really kind of obscure thing. His girlfriend at the time in the lab became allergic to grasshoppers, strangely. <laughs> and he made the most fortuitous switch into the fruit fly for that reason. His girlfriend became his wife and should have won the Nobel Prize with him because obviously he wouldn't have switched into this thing. And he, he discovered this thing called toll, very important toll, right? And toll is a key part of the fly's immune system. It was first found, though, in development in the fruit fly, strangely. So toll's first job, toll's a protein in development. And there was a toll fly here, a toll mutant, couldn't develop properly, was all squished up. And the postdoc who saw that exclaimed toll, he was a German, and toll translates as cool, weird, brilliant, fantastic, wonderful, bodacious, wow. If it was Irish, we call it Gahuntuk, you know. And Toll then became the word for this protein. They win the Nobel Prize, Nusslein Ballhard, for this discovery and development in the fruit fly, right? And that was the Toll pathway. And amazingly, Hoffman finds Toll comes back in the fly and defends that fly from fungi. And here's a Toll deficient fly, comes down with a fungal infection. So Toll double jobs in the fly. It's in development, but it's also in the immune system. He wins the Nobel Prize for this. In fact, for this single picture, I think, has such an impact on immunology. Why was that? Well, it turns out, there, there's the Nobel Prize for discoveries concerning activation of innate immunity. Tolls are everywhere. He finds them in the fruit fly. They're in human. We have 10 of them. There are B alert system. They sense microbes. They launch the immune system. Amazingly, the sea urchin has 220 of them. So it's much more evolved than we are. If you're an immunologist, we have only 10. And they're everywhere. Plants have them. Tolls are the key frontline defense of our immune system. And that's why Hoffman wins the Nobel Prize. And here's one example that's the why it's relevant to medicine, because it's no prize to medicine. It turns out the tolls go wrong in humans. And here's one example from our collaborator, Brendan Jenkins, in Monash. It turns out toll 2 in the human is very important for stomach cancer, strangely. And here we see a tumor forming in, in normal mice, this is. If you block toll 2 with an antibody that blocks this protein, you can have the size of that tumor. And here's the measurement here in the graph of the tumor size. Amazingly, here we have a protein that began in the fruit fly, 
being relevant then to human diseases, and for some reason the tumor here is hijacking the immune system and using it for its own ends, blocked hole two, you may well have a way to treat gastric cancer. And again, the Nobel Prize goes for medicine because of that discovery in the fruit fly. And it's not just cancer, it's boosting vaccines, arthritis, diabetes, transplantation, septic shock, all of these involve this toll system found in the fruit fly by Hoffman in the human, and therefore making tolls a very interesting prospect for new medicines. So there's a good way to put it, from the fruit fly to gastric cancer is really the secret here. So clearly, none of that would have happened without Jules Hoffman being curious about the fruit fly and the grasshopper and finding that protein in the fruit fly, and suddenly we get this huge opening up of a whole field that culminates in new discoveries for the immune system. Let me give you, in the last section, a couple of more thoughts on this, and I'm going to use some quotes now from some of my other heroes. Uh, this is a guy called Max Perutz, and he was the uh, director of the MRC lab in Cambridge for Watson and Crickware and all sorts. Great quote from him. He says, creativity in science, as in the arts, cannot be organized. It arises spontaneously from individual talent. And then he says, discoveries cannot be planned. They pop up like puck. Note the word puck there. Could be mispronounced dangerously. In unexpected places. And that really captures it. How the hell does the government decide what to do then? You know, if that's where real discoveries come from, very hard. So governments have to be aware of this. And if they stop funding this basic type research, we won't make the big breakthroughs is the argument I'm trying to make. Here's a great quote from, um, from, uh, from Perutz as well. He was, uh, Francis Crick was in his lab. And in 1965, he had to write a, re a report to the grant body, the MRC. And he wrote the report. And they wrote back and said, uh, we noticed that uh, Dr. Crick has not published a paper in three years. What's he been doing? Perot's telegram back, he's been thinking, you know. <laughs> so, so I think that's a very good quote, right? You've got to think as well, you see. And then another hero of mine, I'm a bio, was a bio, my biochemistry before immunology, I got a lot of Warburg. He was a very famous biochemist in the 20s. This was his grant application to the German government. It was one line, I require 10,000 marks. <laughs> now you'll notice here, you poor researchers, no impact statement here for this one. You know, it's just... <laughs> It was just, wouldn't those days be marvelous? And he discovered very fundamental pathways in biology, and it's brilliant to see that he gets his grant based on all of that. Now, where does that leave us? Well, remember my point. How are we going to inspire these young people to become scientists? We won't inspire them if all science involves something terribly boring, in essence. You know, this is a great slide. You may have seen something somewhere went horribly wrong here, you know. So if science is all about to apply, now I'm not knocking applied research, it's very important of course as well, we must take these basic discoveries and make them useful. But what inspires the young people is not sitting in front of a computer, although mind you, I spend most of my day sitting in front of a computer. Um, it's this discovery, this basic fundamental frontier discovery is what inspires people. Let me give you one more example. I'm big into music, I wasn't quite that big a fan of Simon and Garfunkel. This was my hero when I was 17 years of age. And this is the sort of person we should be funding in science. Now, obviously, the scientific equivalent, the innovators, the ones who book the trend, you know, the ones who are on the frontier, who are really doing it. And, and of course, the Sex Pistols famously revolutionized music, and they're the sort of people doing the basic research. They're the ones we've got to keep supporting, otherwise we won't make progress. Otherwise, we'd end up with my other favorite band from that time, No More Heroes, because you've got to have heroes. And the heroes are these fundamental basic scientists. So it's very, very important that we keep funding this research. Now, there is hope, actually, in Ireland. And I want to just give a, a shout out again for this, not to be completely negative. Because in that research prioritization exercise, uh, there's two very important lines Richard Bruton himself writes in the introduction. He says, the government recognizes the fundamental role of research for knowledge. And that's very important. This is in the front thing, now, the very covering letter of, of the report. A share of future investment will remain untargeted in order to support excellent basic research in new and unanticipated research areas. Very, very important. So there is hope here that this will actually still happen in Ireland. And I would give a call out now, and I'm going to give this as a, a kind of a, a plea, I guess, in a way. ESOF was a big success here, and, and, and I was involved in the program, and all these 4,500 people turned up, the message went out loud and clear. Ireland's a great place to do science. We get great PR internationally from, you know. A fitting legacy would be for the Irish government to state things even more explicitly and have the, have the courage to book the trend. Because remember, internationally, there's an opportunity now. Basic scientists in other countries are anxious, you know. If we had a special fund just for basic research, that would send this loud message out, Ireland wants to fund this frontier type research. Risky though it may be, long term though it may be, we will fund it. And in that way, we may well inspire the next generation. Thank you very much.